17-year-old Gabe Meyer is dropped off at the local gym by his father. It would be the last time he would see his son. We knew straight away that, that there was something terribly wrong, that he couldn't get to us. His disappearance would take detectives into crocodile-infested waters, into the depths of cane fields and rainforests. In 21 years, I probably never had to experience anything so emotional. And into a world of distorted reality and deadly lies. He wrote me almost every day. He showed us what appeared to be a newly dug grave. All of us were just stunned. It was something out of a horror movie. This was a planned, calculated murder. It was like a, a challenge to him. He was enjoying every minute of it. But he made a very basic error. And hopefully that piece of the jigsaw would fit into the puzzle at a later time. Sherry and Doug Meyer had left their hometown of Miami in the United States to escape the growing crime. Now, halfway around the world, it seemed fate had caught up with them. One of their six children was missing. I started noticing at about 7.30 that he wasn't home and he never missed dinner and would always give us a call to let us know where he was. I asked Doug to call the hospital just to make sure that he hadn't had an accident or anything. The hospital hadn't heard anything, and we thought, well, it's a bit silly, 17. We shouldn't worry so much. He's probably found a mate. He's probably gone to somebody's house or something like that. And we just sort of dozed fitfully, and I kept getting up and going to check his room to see if he'd come home. And it was about 4.30 or 5 in the morning. We just got up and, and started um, to work out what we were going to do, who to call, where to go, because we knew something was terribly wrong. We decided, you know, you know, what's the logical thing to do? First find his friends and see what happens. So we got in the car and drove down toward Damon Kalanka's house. Damon Kalanka was a mate of Gabe's and had been there when Doug Meyer dropped his son off at the gym. We walk up the steps to Damon Kalanka's flat. The door's already open. He comes out and meets us. Go, Damon, have you seen Gabe? Uh, yes, after he left the gym, he came over here to the flat. He was reading some girly magazines. Said he was going out to swim. Doug Meyer came to the police station to report his son Gabe missing. He had two of his friends with him, and they said they didn't know where Gabe was. Gabe had left Damon Kalanka's house in the afternoon to go for a swim at the ski ramp in the Johnston River. And Doug said this was quite unusual because Gabe didn't normally swim in the river. He knew about crocodiles. He knew that you don't swim in the evening especially. The weather was bad, it was raining. It's just so, not something that Gabe would have done. At that point, I spoke to both of the friends and asked um, their thoughts in relation to Gabe, and they said it was unusual. They also indicated that there was no trouble at home, so it seemed a bit unusual that he hadn't returned home and not a normal case of a kid staying away overnight, partying or something like that. All we knew was that we had a missing person and that we have to cover all avenues. So we basically had to track down and speak to as many people as possible that may have seen Gabe and maybe provide information as to his movements. So basically our initial inquiries started at the gymnasium where Doug had dropped Gabe off. We did speak to some people who confirmed that Gabe had been attending the gym and that Gabriel left the gymnasium at approximately 4.30pm. The next step was to ascertain if, in fact, Gabe had gone to the river. There was concern that Gabriel had gone swimming, that he may have drowned or been taken by a crocodile or something of that nature. If a human had been taken by a crocodile, we would certainly hope 
to find remains. It is my understanding that crocodiles do lodge the remains of victims within mangroves. As a consequence of this, uh, we did, in fact, conduct searches uh, of the uh, Johnston River with the Department of Wildlife and local crocodile experts, and there was no signs located at all. Again, another option was the fact that he may have simply run away. We canvassed that possibility with his parents, we canvassed that possibility with his friends. We just told him basically that he was a kid that, you know, would never give us any trouble at all. He'd been through a lot of experiences in his life that had really matured him. He was such a likable kid. Always had been ever since he was little, just a lovely boy that was just really responsible for his age. And that's, I, I guess, why we knew straight away that there was something terribly wrong that he couldn't get to us because he would definitely do that. He would not worry us. Other avenues um, of basic investigation include the tracing of Gabe's bank accounts to see if any withdrawals had been obtained from any branch anywhere in Australia. It included uh, inquiries with the various public transports, airlines, coach services and the Queensland Rail to see if we had any traces. And all inquiries made with the transport companies proved negative. Uh, we had no sign of, of Gabe at all and likewise with his bank accounts uh, they had not been touched. The alarm bells were starting to ring a little louder. Douglas and Shirley Mayer are sick with worry. Their son Gabe was due home for dinner on Tuesday night but never arrived, something they say is completely out of character. Gabe's the kind of guy that wouldn't miss a meal in the evening. If he was not going to be there, he would do home at no let time. us know. Police have scoured nearby streets in the Johnson River. They're treating Gabe's disappearance as suspicious. Oh, we're quite concerned for his safety. We feel um, there may be suspicious circumstances that surround his disappearance. As for Gabe's parents, they've just got one plea if their son is watching this program. Just give us a call. And that, um, That's it. We love you, Gabe. We love him so much. And that all the kids miss him. And we just want to know he's safe. The last person to see Gabe was Damon Kalanka. He said, now look, make sure you tell the police this, that if they want to any, know anything, I'm over there, they know where I live, they just come and talk to me, I'll tell them all about what I know. I asked Damon Clegg to accompany us to the police station if he was willing to take part in an interview. I'm just going to look at the background first. How do you know the name of your mind? I'm going to sister, Helen Clark. I met her, and she was in America. And um, Helen got really close to me. Her brother come to gym and I've uh, seen her gym all the time and I've been this close, this close friend from at the gym. I met him at the gym. He started to say hello to me all of the time and uh, compliment me and ask me how I was doing and he would start conversations and things like that. He was a really friendly guy, um, quite um, charming. And we started to date from there. She was leaving in three weeks to go to America to university. And he was devastated that she was leaving. So we told Fawn, well, look, you know, tell him he can come over for Christmas. And he, and he came over that day. And they invited me after Christmas, and they really like clean up But um, I only went to the gym. He outlined to me how he'd been to the gym the previous afternoon, how he'd met Gabe Meyer, how he had a workout with him. Gabriel attended his unit later on, and Gabriel left shortly thereafter, telling Damon Clanker that he was going swimming. I also asked him about his movements that night and he explained to me how he had uh, hired a utility and uh, was taking uh, a roll of carpet to his sister's place in Tully. carpet that he was allegedly taking to his sister in Tully. It was laid out flat and appeared to be a very, very poor condition, frayed and stained, and not the sort of item I would give as a gift to my uh, sister. That seemed a little bit odd. As a result of that feeling, 
that carpet was taking possession of. The carpet had a large stain down one end and it had some minor stains also down that end. The stains that were on it appeared that it may have been blood and the other minor stains also indicated visually that they could possibly be blood. We used test strips, which was widely used by hospitals at the time. They were called Sangur test strips, and by moistening them with water and touching them onto different stains, if it was blood, it would react straight away and turn green. And these strips were used on all the visible stains that was on that carpet, but there was no significant reaction to any of those strips. I was on a rest day, I got called into duty back to the Innisfail Criminal Investigation Branch office and they explained that uh, young person Gabe Meyer had gone missing. Uh, there was mention of Damon Kalanka and I then spoke to Jacobs and Pickless and explained to them what happened back in 1991 when I had charged him with attempted murder on another young fellow by the name of Paul Malik. He gave us a brief summary of the Malik investigation in that Kalanka had been involved in a relationship with another female uh, who had uh, left him and taken up with Malik. Kalanka arranged to have a meeting with Paul Malik. They went for a drive in Kalanka's car out to an area towards Flyingfish Point. Kalanka and Malik got out of the car and Kalanka had a knife and at some stage Melik was having a conversation with him. He turned his back on Kalanka and Kalanka then stabbed him in the back with the knife. And then Melik ran away. He ran up the Cane headland. He actually got the knife off Kalanka. Kalanka chased him in the car. Uh, Melik looked over his shoulder thinking, what's going on? He looked over his shoulder, saw that Kalanka was speeding up this grass headland on the farm and he jumped in some long grass and he was just missed by the car by a foot or so. Damon Kalanka was charged with attempted murder, but this was dropped at trial. Kalanka pleaded guilty to unlawful wounding and dangerous driving. He got uh, 200 hours community service and also two years good behaviour. I read about it in the newspaper. One day he was with a friend at the gym and they both asked me if I knew about the Paul Mellick incident and I said that I knew a little bit about it and both of them really described it as like a love triangle gone wrong that um, not to believe what I'd read in the papers and um, at the time I didn't really think a lot about it. He wasn't our ideal choice for her but it doesn't work like that. We didn't feel we were in a position to tell her who she could and couldn't date at that point. He was very intense, um, very attentive, very kind, very charming, but a little bit more intense than you would expect from someone who had only just met a young girl. Gabe Meyer was the second eldest of six children. His older sister of two years was in the United States studying when her 17-year-old brother disappeared. I received a phone call from my mother and she said that um, Gabe was missing. She said he hadn't come home the night before and that they were really worried about him. She told me that the last person that had seen him was Kalanka. I immediately thought, oh my God. Fawn and Damon Kalanka had been dating for three weeks before she headed overseas. When I arrived in America, he would write to me and he wrote me almost every day, sometimes twice a day. The letters that he wrote were very much filled with things like, I miss you so much, and I wish I was there with you, and please come back, I'll pay for your flight. I felt smothered by them, and I wanted the relationship to end, and he wouldn't get the hint. Before I left, he asked me, if there was anything that would make me change my mind and come back to Australia. I replied um, that there really wasn't anything that would make me come back unless something happened to my family. 
The significance of that was it then became a belief in the minds of the investigating officers that possibly a way of getting for Maya to return to Australia was something to happen to one of her family. Coupled with that was the fact that Kalanka had been involved in the previous incident with Mally. We had to keep an open mind. We had to be um, objective. But we had fears that something may have happened to Gabe Maya. Damon Kalanka had told detectives that he had spent that night driving a carpet to his sister's. That carpet was examined, but there had been nothing to link it to Gabe. When you've got an investigation, you've got to broad brush everything. You've got to just cover absolutely every avenue. That's why we took the carpet. We didn't know squat at that time. But once we grabbed it, we've got some evidence that can't go away. And hopefully that piece of the jigsaw would, would fit into the puzzle at a later time. Another piece of the jigsaw they hoped would fit was the ute hired by Kalanka to take the carpet to his sister's. He had originally booked it for the following night, but then changed his mind and picked it up at 7 p.m one and a half hours after he had last seen Gabe. Of course, with any rental vehicle, the start mileage is recorded prior to leaving the rental company and the end mileage is recorded when the vehicle is returned. We ascertained that uh, Kalanka had travelled uh, 119 kilometres during the period that he had the vehicle in his possession. Kalanka told the police that he had dropped his next door neighbour off at the local pub before heading to Tully. Halfway to Tully, he turned around. He was home at 9pm. Shortly after, his flatmates went to bed and he went out again. He bought a torch as he thought he'd go fishing. But when it rained, yet again, he went back home. We then travelled the same route as detailed by Kalanka in his version of the events on that date. That included travelling around Innisfail for a short time and then travelling halfway to Tully, whereupon we turned around at the bridge as nominated by Kalanka and returned to Innisfail. We found that the actual distance that we had travelled was 61 kilometres. Uh, as opposed to the 119 as stated by Kalanka. Uh, that is a difference of 58 kilometres, and as you can appreciate, that is a considerable distance. This in itself was a glaring lie and, and really firmed up that Kalanka had been involved in something terrible. The ute was immediately seized for forensic examination. An examination was conducted for fingerprints uh, over the cabin and the tray. But Gabe's fingerprints were not found on the ute nor was any trace of Gabe's hair or fibres from his clothes. There was nothing that we could tie Gabe in with that utility. Next, they conducted scientific tests on Kalanka's flat. As a part of that testing, a polylight was run over the unit completely uh, in an attempt to establish whether there was any blood or spatter patterns or anything of that nature within the unit, which might indicate some sort of fight, altercation or disturbance of that nature, but nothing was identified. I called Kalanka the day after I found out that my brother was missing and I was crying and I asked him, where's my brother? And he said, I don't know, Fawn. Um, I think something terrible might have happened to him. I was sick. I knew he was lying. I knew that Gabe was dead. And I knew that he'd done it. He said even my flatmate heard him say he was going swimming. Police began a process of either confirming or negating Damon Kalanka's version of events, starting with his two flatmates. They were present when Gabe initially arrived at the flat and when he had left at uh, approximately 5.30 on, on that afternoon. Gabriel had told them when he left that he was going swimming. They also told police that they went to the movies just after Gabe left, but were home by 9pm when Kalanka came home. The purchase of the torch was also confirmed. Narinda Singh, a neighbour of Damon Kalanka, he was also interviewed at length in relation to his knowledge of the movements um, of Damon Kalanka on the night of the disappearance of Gabriel Meyer. 
Narinda Singh told us that at about 7pm that night he saw Damon Clanker in the rear car park of the units and in the back of the utility at that time was the roll of carpet. Shortly after that, he looks out of his flat and sees Damon Clanker standing outside his flat looking very breathless. Can I get a lift to the pub later? He called out to him and asked him for a lift up to a local hotel. About 15 minutes later, which would then have been about 7.30, Damon Clanker returned and drove him to the local hotel. Clanker then drove Singh back to the units, which would have then have been approximately 8 p.m., and he advised him at that time that he was off the tully. Thank you very much. So this, in fact, corroborated the version supplied to us by Damon Clanker. Cheers, mate. We also had a witness that came forward that stated that he had seen Gabe walking towards the river, walking past a nearby shop. This was after we had confirmed that Gabe had left the flat and was several blocks away from the flat. Apart from the discrepancy in the kilometres made in the ute, it appeared Damon Kalanka's story was checking out. Then, the discovery of Gabe's bag on the banks of the Johnson River added to the confusion. This bag was found by SES volunteers on the banks of the Johnson River and has been identified as Gabe's. Police are now relying on it as a crucial piece of evidence in their efforts to find the missing 17-year-old. Even though we were as certain as we could be that Gabe wouldn't have willingly gone and swam in the river, sometimes you sort of second-guess yourself and say, you know, did he do something really stupid? The fact surrounding the location of the knapsack was published and as a result of this, two young witnesses came forward who stated that they had seen items of clothing on the pontoon around about 7.30pm on the day Gabe went missing. We also had some witnesses come forward who stated they had seen other youths throwing some of these items into the river. There's certainly the possibility that someone had placed those items there in an attempt to throw us off, uh, or it certainly could have been the case that they'd been placed there by Gabriel prior to going swimming. After a brief meeting this morning with local investigators, police divers set up for a long day in the muddy waters of the Johnston River near Campbell Street. We were glad that the police divers were coming, and while we didn't want to admit that what they might find, we, we just wanted Gabe back at that point and we were really hopeful that they would find him or find, you know, something to let us know what had happened. After using explosive charges to clear any crocodiles from the vicinity, the divers entered the murky water. The visibility was totally nil, so they had to conduct uh, grid searches uh, just by touch alone. And the first lucky break of this investigation was uh, within two minutes of the search patterns commencing. After about half an hour, two of the divers surfaced and handed a wristwatch to the observer. It's believed the watch is the same as Gabriel's, and later, after police showed it to the teenager's parents, they said they were too upset for an interview. When they called us and said that they had found a watch, I think we had to, um, to go identify it, and it was the most horrible, I think, at that point did confirm to us that Gabe was dead. Whatever way it was, we knew he was gone. The watch proved to me beyond any doubt that there was foul play involved because the watch was a diver's watch and it, it had a double clip on it that it just couldn't accidentally fall off. It would have to have been removed. That watch was found within throwing distance of the jetty and it was obvious to me that someone had thrown that out there for us to find. Detective Kruger asked me if I would contact Kalanka and try to find out if he would tell me anything. Because at this stage, we were trying to find out where Gabe was. I called him and I said to him that I wasn't coming home until I found out what had happened to Gabe. I thought that by doing that, we may force Kalanka's hand in, in going and moving the body from wherever he had it, so somewhere that we would find it. 
The call was made and unfortunately Kalanka didn't make any move except to spot the surveillance and uh, it was all over. Then a young man by the name of James Potter contacted the police with information. Just over two weeks before Gabe disappeared, he'd gone to a thickened area of rainforest with Damon Kalanka. He told us Kalanka showed him a cleared area of palm trees in the rainforest and Kalanka had marked this area with a cross with some sticks on the ground. Kalanka told Potter that the cross was to identify the spot when he next came out camping. Later that day, we travelled to Polly Creek and Potter showed us an area where he'd been with Damon Kalanka and there was what appeared to be a newly dug grave under some palm leaves in the rainforest. When you first see the hole, it's just, it's nothing else but a grave. The shape of it, the depth of it, and there was no doubt in my mind that that was to be someone's grave. Police decided it was time to bring Damon Kalanka in for another interview. They hoped the revelations of the grave-like hole at Polly Creek would trigger a confession. At this point of the interview, Damon Kalanka asked for an adjournment. The mention of Polly Creek, he basically froze, insisted on having a solicitor that was obtained. The interview then recommenced, and Kalanka told police why he dug the hole. We didn't believe that because the area, firstly, wasn't a very ideal for growing marijuana. It was so thick. And secondly, uh, there was never any suggestion, even on Kalanka's own admission, he wasn't a user of marijuana uh, and had never been involved in, uh, in the marijuana business. Did you go up to Polly Creek with the youth that No, I didn't go up. I was going to go up in the morning, on Wednesday morning. But when the gay father turned up, I just came and I just said, no, I'll get rid of the youth. That way I wouldn't have houses with the youth. So like I said to them, the reason why I'm doing this is because they don't want to lie to you. I don't want to put any smoke screens up and say, oh, I'm doing this and that. Because you only get yourself caught in trouble if you keep trying to tell stories. What do you say to the rumour that you've killed a young guy or you've to get born and come back to Australia? Like I said to Vaughan, as you rang me up on Monday, we were talking about it and I said, look, if, if you thought that I did this just to get you back, you would go back anyway. So there's no, no choice. I can't see the thinking behind that because I'd love to end your life. I've no intention of hurting anybody and I would never do something like that. It was like a a challenge to him. Uh, he seemed to be enjoying talking to us. Well, he knew what we had, basically, and what we didn't have, and I got the distinct feeling that he was enjoying every minute of it. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I think he has gone. I think he has taken off. Well, why do you think that? No, just that some of the things that he says and does, he is very adventurous, and if he wants to do something, he'll do it. But he's probably sitting somewhere now. Probably just having the first time in his life, that's what he probably wants to do. And, but I'm, I'm angry with him, the fact that I'm going through all this. Yeah. But if he came back, I'd probably still try to be nice to him. You know? But if someone to get blamed for something like they put something on me, and I go to jail, and then in 10 years' time, it ends up with his wife, you know, that's what was really upsetting me. We certainly were getting a feel that something was seriously wrong with the mental processes of Kalanka. Some suggestions were that uh, his behaviour would be uh, sociopathic and the reasoning behind the events of Melik and as events were unfolding with Gabriel, 
that the behaviour was bizarre and uh, certainly not by a normal person. At that point, we really needed to find Gabriel's body to show basically that it wasn't taken by a crocodile and on finding the body that we would then find some sort of forensic evidence which would tie Kalanka to the offence. Police firmly believed Damon Kalanka was involved in the disappearance of Gabe Meyer. And while they had a circumstantial case, they had no body. And then, on Australia Day, only two weeks after Gabe disappeared, that changed. I received a phone call from Margaret Carmichael and she informed me that she'd found a suspicious site on the farm and she was concerned that it may have been something sinister and it may have been Gabe Meyer. The shallow grave was reported to police at midday yesterday by locals who noticed freshly turned soil in scrub near Moresby Creek outside Innisfail. Police immediately excluded media and the public from the scene while the remains were exhumed for forensic tests. In 21 years, I've probably never had to experience anything so emotional and so draining and uh, I felt terrible sorrow for the family at that stage. There are things that a parent knows somehow. I don't fully understand it myself, but there are certain things that you know. And that was one of them that they didn't have to tell us, we knew. To actually have his body found was, was a relief. And yet, it was just the, so horrific, you know, to... I remember saying to them, where did you find him? Did you find him in the river? And he said, no, he was in a, a grave. Upon exhuming the soil, we located what appeared to be a human hand that was obviously tied behind the person. And as we removed all the soil from around the deceased, we found that both the hands and feet had been tied, that the deceased had been wrapped in a blanket and then further twine tied around the blanket. Gabe's body was removed and taken to the morgue. Meanwhile, the witness who had found him near the creek on the cane farm she lived on was being interviewed. She stated that on the night of the disappearance, uh, she in fact did see a set of headlights driving from the highway through a back, back road to the area around where the gravesite was located. Also, the day before she contacted police, she did see Kalanka coming from that area. There was no doubt in her mind it was Damon Kalanka. Kalanka's parents lived next door to her. It appears that uh, Kalanka had in fact been raised in this area, was very familiar with the area, and had in fact fished just a matter of metres from where the gravesite was. The post-mortem results on Gabe showed he had not been murdered in any overt manner, like being stabbed or shot. So while detectives waited for toxicology reports, other immediate evidence was being followed up. During the post-mortem, police obtained quite a number of exhibits, such as the twine that was used to bind the hands and feet, and also uh, the uh, blanket that was wrapped around the deceased. Police have now released this blanket found during their investigations. They and the Mayer family are urging anyone with any information to come forward. A couple of days later, Kalanka's ex-wife did contact police and stated that the blanket she had seen on television was in fact the same as the blanket she had owned when she was married to Kalanka. And the rope that was used was similar to rope that had been in Kalanka's flat and was now missing and it belonged to his flatmate. In addition, strips from the blanket were sent for forensic analysis. As a result of this testing, six polypropylene fibres were found that did not come from the blanket itself. These fibres were then compared with fibres taken from a piece of the carpet that had been recovered from Kalanka's unit. And they matched. Now their thoughts went back to the cause of death and whether Gabe could have been drugged. When we were considering the scenario of Gabriel being poisoned, we do recall that early in the investigation, Kalanka had stated that he supplied 
Gabriel a drink of sustagen. Now I promise you to stop to slug it, a protein shake, and you have it with milk and it does increase salt, and then when he said, you know, I got it for you. Made some up for it. There was nothing wrong with it. You know, I just made some up for it. He um, yeah, added to that, and then at 5:30 he said, "Come," and I said, "See you later." He went to great pains to tell us that I just gave him a, a glass of sausage and there was nothing wrong with it. I just took the seal off it. He, he, he just went on so much about this glass of sausage and that it had to be suspect. When the toxicology report came in, the results were chilling. Gabe had been given a carefully calculated cocktail of drugs. Well, the laboratory found paracetamol, pseudephedrine, chlorpheniramine, and uh, metoclopramide in the liver and stomach contents. When that combination is present, one really thinks of a cold and flu preparation. The toxicology report showed very high levels of these drugs in the tissues, meaning there had been an overdose. Depending on how much was used, how much was consumed and absorbed, it could kill him. More likely is to cause extreme drowsiness, perhaps falling asleep and then he could easily have been asphyxiated or smothered in some way or killed in another way that would not have had much of the resistance from him to respond to any act against him. When Gabe was uh, discovered at the gravesite, police located a small piece of uh, plastic that was adhered to his face. A very unusual shape, uh, almost like a small rectangle with a hole cut in the middle of the rectangle. It was identified as enforcing for a plastic bag, and that was part of a plastic bag that may have been placed over Gabriel's head. The detectives now had enough circumstantial evidence to make an arrest. But Damon Kalanka wasn't going to make it easy. He had another lie up his sleeve. This entire case was going to be fought on intent. It was central to the case to be able to prove that this was a planned, calculated murder and not a murder that was committed in the heat of passion. When Damon Kalanka was arrested for the murder of Gabe Meyer, he refused to speak with police, but he did talk to his own sister. Deborah Morton told the magistrate that Kalanka had at first denied any involvement, that she'd then gone on the attack and was out to crack him. She said she'd told Kalanka, for once in your life, I want you to be a man and tell us the truth. The family needs to know that you've been nothing but a compulsive liar all your life. Mrs Morton then told the court that her brother started to tremble, then said, I did it, that when she asked him why, Kalanka replied that Gabe had been coming on to him in the gym, always touching him, that he'd got angry, lost control and strangled him. I, I think at first we were enraged to think that he would try to say these things about Gabe and then we thought, this is a desperate, desperate person. But when police first spoke with Kalanka, that defence was never mentioned. I recall asking him if uh, he believed or knew that Gabriel may, have, may not have been homosexual. No. Kalanka was going to argue that he did not intentionally kill Gabe Meyer and that accordingly he should only be convicted of manslaughter and should get a far shorter, shorter sentence. So this entire case was going to be fought on intent. It was central to the case to be able to prove that this was a planned, calculated murder and not a murder that was committed in the heat of passion. The gravesite measuring exactly that of the grave found at Polly Creek was evidence of premeditation. He was planning to take Gabe Meyer out to Polly Creek on some pretense, because you had to walk in there, and he planned to kill him and then bury him there. But he was too anxious. He was too keen to kill Gabe Meyer. The concoction administered by Kalanka to Gabriel was, was in fact too strong and rendered him unconscious. 
As such, Kalenka was forced to use the Martyville site. And there was further evidence of his intention. On the 5th of January, Kalenka called me again and he started the conversation by asking me what my decision was. He said, I'm ready for you to drop the bombshell. Don't worry, I'm used to rejection. I responded by telling him that it was over and that we were silly to think that this could keep going. On the very next day, Damon Kalanka went shopping. After the arrest, police did continue further inquiries to uh, re reinforce the uh, prosecution's case. One of the avenues was to approach all of the chemists in the area. One chemist ascertained that Kalanka had purchased two packets of Vicks Headclear and the exact ingredients of the head clear tablets were exactly the same as the toxicology results from the deceased. So that was the final link in the chain. We could connect him to the drug that was found in uh, Gabe Meyer's body, and that pointed to a very calculated killing. Essentially, the prosecution case was that the two flatmates go out around 5.45 p.m. It seems that very shortly after that, Gabe Meyer returns. Kalanka didn't kill Gabe in the heat of passion. He gave Gabe this drink. He watched him drink it. And he watched him go unconscious. Would have taken 45 minutes before he actually passed out. Just picturing the face that was in Gabe's face and what Gabe was picturing, you know, was this guy standing there and telling him what was going to happen to him? All this going through your mind, well, it just suddenly became overwhelming and it's very out of character for me, but I turned around and I punched the wall. He bound his hands. He bound his legs. He put a plastic bag around his head. By the time that Kalanka has gone to pick up the ute, Gabe Meyer is already dead or well on the way. Kalanka has then wrapped Gabe in the carpet from the garage and placed him in the back of the ute. This is where Singh calls out and asks for a lift to the hotel. And that's when Kalanka says, in about half an hour or so. Kalanka then drove down to the pontoon where he placed Gabriel's towel, shoes, knapsack on the pontoon. Then he throws the watch into the water. He then uh, gives his neighbour Singh a lift to the local pub to cash his paycheck and then drops him back. Then he does a quick trip out to the farm where he dumps Gabe Meyer's body and then quickly drives back. Kalenka arrives home to his flatmates for the 9pm alibi and they go to bed soon after. And that is when Kalanka left the flat to go to the service station and buy a torch and batteries. And he then goes back out where he digs the grave for Gabe Meyer just off the track on that farm. But he made a very basic error. He drove too far. The 58 kilometres missing from Kalanka's account that night with the two trips from his unit out to and back from the gravesite. Over the years, I have done many murder trials and I cannot think of one that has the same mixture of cold planning and cold execution. After more than five hours' deliberation, the jury found Damon Frank Kalanka guilty of the murder of Gabriel Meyer. Damon Kalanka was given a mandatory life sentence, but the judge warned that the parole board should be careful in considering any application. 
Kalanka is eligible to ask for that release in 2006. We've dreaded this time for all these years. We know that this man will kill again. And we can't even imagine that any parole board would let this man out. I have grave concerns about that, not only for my own safety and my family's safety, but for anyone else out there. He has done this before. He's done it this time, and he'll do it again. I have no doubt about that.